Grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. God is light, in whom there is no shadow or darkness. God is love. Those who love are newborn from God. God is spirit, and worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Most holy God, and Christ Jesus, you have shown us a light and a love, which is overwhelming. As we worship you, let us not be frightened by your glory, but enraptured with your love. In quiet confidence, may we take authority over all those negative influences that burden, handicap, and seek to ruin humanity. Empower us with your spirit that we may be enabled to take charge of our own lives without looking over our shoulder or fearing what lies around the next bend. Through Christ our Savior, we are saved. Amen. Amen. We will now have announcements from Gloria Southworth, our literatures for today. Welcome, welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. For visitors and members alike, the yellow attendance card in the pews are direct communication to the pastor. If you have a question, concern, or prayer request, or message, please fill out the card and place it in the offering plate. For those who wish to make an electronic donation, you can do so with your smartphone via Sela or PayPal. Our address to donate for both payment services is donate at springfieldpresbyterian.org. Please contact the office if you would like to dedicate a floral arrangement for our weekly worship services. If you would like to host fellowship hour, the sign-up sheet in the info table on the chapel is on the info table in the chapel gathering area. Thank you for the Oconquo family for hosting today. Just a quick word, yes. Wait a minute, I want you to talk about the 4th of July. Yeah. Uh, uh, just a quick word, the office sent out uh, um, kind of a special edition of the tower. I am trusting that you all received it, yes? Yes? Please read it. <laughs> um, it's about what we did in, uh, for Vacation Bible School. It was really cool. Thank you all for participating. And there is also some, a little bit of a, um, and thank you. Thank you, Lisa, over there for leading us. And um, a little bit of a, of a review of what, what we're doing next. So please uh, do take a minute to read it and, uh, and respond, communicate uh, with the office and with me. Thank you. For those who might not be familiar with the part that this church played in the Revolutionary War, I'd like to give you some background. The local citizenry threw, though, in their lot after the Declaration of Independence, enlisting in the Continental Army, and using the church as a center for public stores. Worship services were conducted in the garret of the parsonage. June 23rd, the British march to Morristown was stopped in Springfield. In the heat of the battle, the Watts Hymnal incident took place. The pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Elizabeth, the Reverend James Caldwell, was a chaplain in the Continental Army. When it appeared that this man, that this man, these men, were short of wadding for their guns, he went to the Springfield Church and took an armful of Watts hymnals. These he gave to the men for wadding with the exhortation Put Watts into him, boys, he commemor the commemor in commemoration of this incident. Bret Hart wrote the well-known poem entitled Cold Coldwell at Springfield. The original painting by John Ward Dunsmore, captioned Battle of Springfield, New Jersey, hangs at, in Francis Tavern, New York City. A copy hangs in the Springfield Municipal Court. The British, in their retreat, set fire to the Presbyterian Church. All houses in town except five 
and the ripening wheat fields where the villagers had hidden their belongings. The townspeople cast down, but not discouraged, worked to rebuild the town and met for worship in the old parsonage barn since, that outgrown, since they had outgrown the garret or attic of the parsonage. Now for our centering words. A word distinction that might be worth mentioning. Sometimes we are disciples, that is, learners. Sometimes we are apostles, that is, sent out ones. The old illustration of the Dead Sea might apply to some of our people. All inflow and no outflow produces death by Brian Struggan. Jen. Call to worship responsibly. Bear one another's burdens. Carry each other's joys and sorrows. Do not grow weary in doing what is right. Work for the good of all, especially for the family of faith. We enter this time of worship. Our opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we want to follow you wherever you lead. Reach out to us this day, stirring our souls and spirits with the winds of your power that we may faithfully be your disciples. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let us stand and sing our first opening hymn, number 339, Lift Every Voice and Sing.
going to ask for all my little friends to come forward for children's time. Come on and sit over here with me. Let's have a confabulation over here. How you doing? Good. Oh, oh. <laughs> how you, baby? <laughs> now, I have a question to ask you. Do you do chores at home? Not really anymore. What kind of chores do you do, Adora? I wash the dishes. You wash the dishes. You, oh, you, you take, take care of your room, make sure it's clean and neat. I use the laundry. You use the laundry. Is this on? Yes, it yes. is. Yes, it is. What else do you do? That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. What kind of chores do you do? Uh, uh, are you telling me that you young men don't do any chores at home? What? I can't believe it. You do nothing at home? To, to pick up or clean up or wash dishes or sweep the floor, go outside and shovel snow when it snows or do mow lawn or nothing. Oh, my goodness gracious. I got to tell you, I had two sons, and I had my sons to do everything they could possibly do. And they cleaned, they did their wash the dishes. I had a list on the refrigerator because I was a working mom. So I had to make sure that when I came home, everything was ready so I could do their homework, get them ready for bed, and make sure they had everything they needed. So I would check off the list. And if they didn't do something that was on that list, then something was taken away. So they made sure they did everything on the list. So you guys are very fortunate that you don't have any chores to do. But Amora, on, on, on the other hand, she has her chores. So I want to share one reason why chores are important, because you get to learn to live on your own one day as adults. Do you expect to live at home all your lives? No, you don't. You don't. Okay. So that's the reason why we do chores. It prepares you to live a life on your own. So that starting you to teach stuff now by having you do the chores would be very beneficial to you later on. So I bring this up because in today's scripture story, we see Jesus giving his disciples some chores to do. And he's giving them chores for the same reasons he talked about why your family gives you chores. So that you'll know how to do the things Jesus thinks is important once they are out in the world without him. The chores Jesus gave the disciples are a little bit different than house chores, though. Did you hear what the actual things the disciples were supposed to do in today's story? They're supposed to do a whole bunch of things. They were to go among the people. They were to teach the people about the kingdom of God. They were to share God's peace with the households who welcomed them. They were to eat whatever that was given to them. And they were to cure the sick. So what happened? How well did you think the disciples did with their chores? Very well. Very well. Do you agree? They did well with their chores. That's right. The disciples did their chores very well. I know that chores are sometimes are not very fun, which is why I want you to notice that the disciples were excited that they were able to do the chores that Jesus, Jesus gave them. Um, are, do you get excited when you do the chores at home? Not really. <laughs> In case you didn't hear, she said, not really. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, so one of the reasons why they were excited, the disciples, because they were seeing what they could do that mattered, like teaching. And Jesus did that well. Even if Jesus wasn't physically with them, the disciples were able to go ahead and teach what he had told them. So today's story reminds us, us that in some way, the disciples learned to do what Jesus did. So can we. So are you going to go home now, Charles, and say, Mommy, give me a chore to do. <laughs> he did this. So I guess that means I don't know. So maybe you can think about it because mommy's work and they're busy. They take you to all your events all the time. So if you could think of something to relieve them of some of the things that they have to do, it would be nice. So it would be nice if you came in the kitchen and said, well, I'll tell you what, maybe you have a dish dryer. Do you all have a, di a, a dish dryer? 
so you can't wash dishes and dry, so that's done already. But they can unload. You can put them away. Oh, did you hear what your mommy said? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, I got you in trouble. <laughs> and what about you, Emmanuel and Chris? What do you think you could do now that we talked about chores? Does your mommy and daddy work? Yeah, they do. So when they come home from work, is there anything you could think of you can do to make their time easier when they come home from work? Because guess what? When you work all day, you're tired. You just want to come home and get something to eat and relax and not have to worry about doing chores. So, Chris, what do you think you can do? That's Emmanuel. That's, That's Chris. This is Emmanuel. <laughs> Emmanuel, so what do you think you can do? Here. Cleaning our room. Cleaning your room. Do you both have the same room? Do you share the same room? Okay. What about you, Chris? What do you think you could do? Wash the dishes. Are you a good dishwasher or have you washed dishes before? I'm not that good, but I am. Okay, he said he's not that good, <laughs> but he will try. <laughs> he will practice. I got to tell you, that was one of my chores when I was a little girl. And when I didn't wash it properly, I lived in a house with two uncles, two grandmothers, a mother, and a father. So you can better believe that I had a whole lot of folks watching what I did. And when I didn't wash those dishes or the glass is good, my uncle would come up behind me. He hold up the glass, and if he saw any water stains on there, he'd throw it back in the water. And if he looked at the dish and it wasn't cleaned properly, he'd throw it back in the water. So you know what that taught me? What did you think that taught me? Um, you better clean it well. Yeah! Clean it right the first time. And you won't have to keep going back and forth, going back and forth. So anyhow, that's today's lesson. So you know what I want you to do? If you come to church next Sunday, I want you to tell me what you did to help your parents out by some chore that you did. Fair enough? Okay. Now let us pray. Repeat after me. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Who helps us learn. Who helps us learn. How to live your better way. How to learn your better way. And share it with others. Just like he did. Just like he did. Thank you and amen. Thank you and amen. Thank you. You were a great group. Thank you, Toss. Don't forget your homework. <laughs> Let us now have our call to confession. Unlike ours, God's anger does not last. But God's favor, God's grace, and God's forgiveness are for us, not just in this moment, but forever. How can we not want to confess to such a one who is ready to heal us? Please join me as we pray together the prayer of concession and the assurance of pardon. Holy one, we confess that our trust is often misguided, placed in institutions and worldly leaders rather than in you. We put our trust in the stock market, the quarterly projections, and the poll numbers. We look to the signs for wealth and prosperity instead of the signs of your work around us, often on the margins among those with the most need. We search for assurance among those who say what we want to hear rather than listening to the cries for justice that makes us uncomfortable. Forgive us for placing our trust in the world we created rather than in you, the creator of heaven and earth. Call us to repent, to turn back to you. Open our hearts to discern your voice and to place our trust in you, our maker, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Now let's take a few moments to take our side and confession to our Lord. Now let us rise and sing our glory to God whose goodness shines on me. Glory to God whose goodness shines on me and to the sun whose goodness bright in me and to the spirit whose gladness set me free as the world 
ever shall be. Amen. We're without end. the Lord be always with you. Amen. Amen. Illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Amen. Today's first scripture is from the Old Testament, 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14, the New Revised Standard Version. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Armenians, on the one of the raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go then and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, and you may cure him of his leprosy. Then the king of Israel read the letter. He tore his clothes and said, I am God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy. Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. 
But then, but when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, and he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Fapar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage, but his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more then, how much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading comes from the gospel of Luke. Chapter 10, also in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, Go out into its street and say, even the dust of, of your own town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watch Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the Spirit submits to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Last uh, Sunday, Pastor Madeline posed a series of questions, poignant questions, I should say. So I want to start my sermon by restating them. Oh, you thought you were going to get away with this that she asked questions and then she would leave you alone and nothing else would come out of it. Wrong, we talk. So here are the questions. 
Are you determined to seek after God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? You remember that question? All right. Well, here's a refresher. Or, she asked, are you trying to have it both ways? Are you trying to serve God just enough to keep him happy, just enough to keep your conscience quiet, while at the same time you are also following the things of the world? She asked that. She then reminded us of the words of the Amen to the church of Laodicea. I know your deeds, she said, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, because when you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Am I quoting you right? Absolutely right. Good. She then concluded her sermon with some more questions. What do you need to be completely devoted to Christ, she asked. What boat is God calling you to burn? What escape hatch or exit door do you need to slam shut and padlock? Right? What tangible steps of commitment is God calling you to make today? Well, you had a whole week to think about this, folks. So, um, I'm going to assume that you, you all, thought long and hard about these questions and decided the following. Stop me if you think I'm wrong. Number one, you're not lukewarm. Am I right? Rather, you are all in for the Lord. I see some nodding. That's good. Number two, you are willing to burn some ships and quite literally look forward, not back. Likewise, you're not looking for an escape hatch or an exit door to get away from being a true disciple of Christ. Am I right? Okay, good. No escaping? No? Good. We're making progress. Number three, you are genuinely listening to what steps of commitment God is calling you to make today. You are paying attention to what God is telling you, what steps of commitment God is calling you to make today. Well, we are in luck today because, as it happens, today's scripture reading are a prescription for taking steps of commitment. Isn't that great when it all works together, you know? From the Gospel of Luke, which I just read, we learned that Jesus sent 70 of his disciples on a mission. 70. Why 70? Any clue? Why, why not 50? Why not 100? Why not 24? I don't know. 36? I don't know. So the number 70 was a symbolic number to Jesus' Jewish audience. And I'll tell you why. 70 elders helped Moses in the wilderness. There were 70 members of the Sanhedrin in the time of Jesus. There was a supreme council of the Jewish people. There were also, or so they believe, 70 countries in the world in the first century. 70 countries in the world. If I may interpret this, I would say that we are commanded to go and do the mission work to the ends of the earth, 70 countries, following in the best of the traditions of the past, the 70 elders that helped Moses, and using contemporary means. We heard from the reading that Jesus sent them in pairs, two by two. All right, folks, this is so like not an American thing to, to you know, it's like me, right? My individual right, my 
bootstraps which you pull apparently to lift yourself up all by your lonesome self. Mission is not any of that. There is no individual piety that would, not, uh, that would not benefit from companionship. Our Christian brothers and sisters hold us accountable. Excuse me, they encourage us in our faith and remind us of God's steadfast love. We are not in this alone. The mission is not a personal, private pursuit of holiness or virtue signaling to show the world how good we are as a person and how much we care. This is not about individual persons. We do this in pairs, in groups, in coordination with one another, creating the partnership necessary for success. No one, no one can do this alone. No one is expected to be a disciple in isolation, to be a private follower of Christ. No such thing. A closeted Christian, if you will. The kind that only reveals themselves on Sunday morning from 10, 15 to 11, 30. We're going to be here for a while, folks. And please listen to this. Um, no amount of clever brochures and advertising placards, banners, no amount of social media promotion, not even a series of great sermons, and you do do those, are as effective to bring in the message of God than two of you, two of you, any two of you, sharing honestly and earnestly your love for God and for one another. We also read that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Meaning, yeah, there will always be more work than workers. It's just the nature of the mission. But let's not be confused. The harvest is plentiful. Let's not allow the fruit of God's labor to rot in the field because we couldn't be bothered to show up and harvest the produce. Let me not mince words. There are hundreds of thousands of people in the church's 10-mile radius who are eager, scratch that, not eager, starving, for an authentic message of hope and direction in life. All the talk about secularization of society and all the discussions about why people don't go to church anymore may be missing the point. The command, the commission, is not to drag people to church, kicking and screaming, but to go out of our comfy, cozy setting and bring the message of hope and healing to the people where they are. Where they are. Oh, it's good to meet here in worship and fellowship. It's great. But this is just the beginning. What happens after we leave church on Sunday morning is the commission. So the reading continues, go on your way, see, I am sending you like lambs into the midst of wolves. Meaning, will it be a walk in the park? No. As every disciple of the Christ encountered a smooth path, plenty of success and no opposition to speak of? Don't think so. But we hear from the account that they were successful. They were successful. They exercise power over the dark forces of the day, and that even demons submitted to them. There are hundreds of thousands of people around us held hostage by all kinds of demons, all kinds of despair, all kinds of dependencies, and all kinds of difficulties, and we have the power to help. We do. 
The gospel tells us further, carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in the peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Jesus told his followers that they were to bring peace to their households. Peace. Not controversy, not disputes, not divisions. Peace. They were to cast out demons and heal the sick and proclaim that the kingdom of God had come near. These instructions of Jesus may need to be expressed in a more contemporary way. Disciples of Jesus Christ who are sent in mission and ministry are challenged to share with all those they meet the awesome truth that God loves them. That's the basic message, folks. They are to demonstrate through word and deed, that God loves all the people around them. Disciples demonstrate God's love by healing the sick, providing, providing for the needs of those in need, and reminding them that difficult times do not deny God's love, but are an opportunity to experience God's love. Look, the church has a mixed record with that, right? Yeah. Often Christians have preferred to proclaim God's judgment and anger. Calamities are called upon people who don't conform to whatever design the person speaking has in mind. Rather than calling on what God has asked us to call upon, which is healing. Look, judgment, deciding on our own who's in and who's out, our little private club, has occupied the mind, oh, scratch that, scratch that, has stifled the mind and sucked the energy of the church for millennia. This pointless, pointless, controversies that the church is engaged into. The Methodists, by the way, are about to split. Mind and energy that needs to be put to the service of the towns and communities where we are sent to minister. And the minister of the commission are all of us. Not just the paid pastor. We are all not evangelists. We need not and should not put the burden of guilt on ourselves. That doesn't mean we shouldn't know how to lead someone to Christ. We're not all evangelists, but we are all ministers. If you have the time, read Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, the pastors, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. This is how the church is supposed to work. There are leaders, yes. Are they here to do the work? All by their lonesome selves? Not at all. Their work is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Leaders equip the saints for the work of minister, ministry. Ministry. Who are the saints? Y'all. Y'all are. So the ministers aren't just the pastor. The ministers are all of us. We share equally in the responsibility of being ministers in the commission to represent Christ. We just do it in different ways. Some of us preach, some teach, some invite, some help, some build, some open their homes for Bible study, some lead the study, some provide Food for the needy, some demonstrate unusual integrity at work that raises question about Christ. Some sow, some water, some reap, but we're all ministers. I love also the injunction about not carrying a purse or an extra pair of underwear. Well, that's not exactly what it says, but you kind of get the idea, right? What does that mean? I think it means that we cannot wait until we are fully equipped to do what we are called to do. 
It means that we cannot put ministry as a slave of the budget, for example. But rather, we need to identify what we are commanded to do in our community, what ministry is there for us to fulfill, and then figure out a way of funding it. A sacrificial way of funding it, by the way. Does this sound messy to you? Yeah, it sounds messy to me. Just as messy as dust in sandals, scorpions, snakes, and demons. But it is out of the mess of life that the apostles changed the world in Jesus' name. The last section of the reading is about the business of shaking or wiping the dust off your shoes when encountering unreceptive ears. Let me be clear about this. We are trying many different ministries, ministries, not entertainment. I thank you, Pastor, for the distinction last Sunday. Some will succeed. Some will fail. Be ready for this. We will learn from the experience, shake the dust off our shoes, and move on to the next ministry, the next need. We will move on to exercise the next demon. We will move on to face a different snake and a different scorpion. We will move on to have a different conversation with another group of people, maybe more receptive ones, knowing that none of what we do is in vain. None of what we do is in vain. So knowing that, remember you are not lukewarm. You are willing to burn some ships and quite literally look forward, not back. You are not looking for an escape hatch or an exit door to get away from being a true disciple of Christ. And so I ask you again, what steps of commitment God is calling you to make today? May you find the answer and be prompted to action. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's take a minute to reflect. Amen. Let us say together our affirmation of faith. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into seven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the time when we ask prayers not just for ourselves, but for the world. Let us pray. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers as dear to us as our own needs. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we offer our thanksgivings and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. You have called your church to live in peace and promised to be with us to the end of the age. Lead us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let the leaders of our nations and in all authority throughout the world live in the grace of Jesus, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Bless the Trinity, one God. Lord, in recognition of Immigration Sunday, which this has been designated, Immigration Sunday. Give the president and the members of the cabinet, governors of states, mayors of cities, and to all in administrative authority, the wisdom, compassion, and grace in the exercise of their duties to all people. To senators and representatives, 
And those who make our laws in the states, cities, and towns give courage, wisdom, give them foresight to provide for the needs of all people and to fulfill our obligations in the community of our nations. To the judges and officers of our courts, give them understanding and integrity that human rights may be safeguarded and justice served. Lord, hear our prayer. Bless everything that lives and protect your people everywhere that all may enjoy the fruits of the earth and be free from hunger, oppression, and injustice. Lord, hear our prayer. You have made humankind in your divine image. Hear our prayers for healing and wholeness on the behalf of those whom we intercede. And especially let us pray for those who are suffering from all kinds of of diseases that hamper us from being able to take just a walk in the park, just to get our limbs together sometimes to function. And as we get older, Lord, we are presented with more and more things that we had not anticipated in terms of our physical health. So dear Lord, be with everyone who is suffering from cancer and other debilitating diseases, diabetes, heart problems, heart transplants, kidneys, all kinds of people who are looking for help. And Lord, let us be able to get good results from tests that we are undertaking. And Lord, let us pray for all our doctors and nurses and care providers. Keep them well and safe so they can take care and provide for others. And may God bless them for choosing an occupation that puts them in jeopardy but they do not allow that to interfere with what they have decided the Lord has put on their hearts to do, and that is to help others. And dear Lord, if there's anyone here who would like to have a corporate prayer for all of us to pray for, please make yourself known now. Yes, Chris and Charles. My friend, teammate Balboa's house was burned down about a week ago. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, it burned down uh, on the 25th. Um, they lost everything. Oh, my goodness. All they goodness. have is what was left that they were out for the day. Um, they've already, we've been posting somebody from, it's on his soccer team. So they've been posting for a GoFundMe page. They're looking for an apartment right now. So they're not sure if that's going to be a furnished apartment or, or what they're going to really need. But... Um, definitely keep them in their prayers. There's two boys and two parents, and they're a great family, for sure. Um, I'm also grateful that we had a very wonderful vacation to see family out in the Midwest, and we've made it back here to everyone here. But. Beautiful. We missed you, but we knew you guys were out doing your thing. Um, Chris, please give us a list of things that we, as a church, can do to help out. Supplies or clothing or... Anything that we may be able to help, Chris, let us know. Okay, good. Perfect. Anyone else? Heather. Um, prayers for my friend Nicole. She's going to, um, she's experienced her second bout with stomach cancer. They re removed the stomach um, about two years ago. Mm. And now she said she's battling with it again. Oh, my goodness. So her name is what again? Nicole. Nicole. Let us all pray for Nicole, that she'll stamp out that devil cancer again. Yes, we will all pray for Nicole. Anyone else? How about those who are having birthdays or anniversaries that you'd like to share with us? Um, something sad or okay. whatever. And I'm not quite sure how to articulate this, but... I keep thinking of those immigrants who were found dead. Yes. And I, I, we need to pray for them, but I, how can we go out and somehow uh, change the, the, the way they're handled? I, those people who promised to bring them over and then abandon them. Uh, yes. Somehow, I, if... I just don't know how to articulate that. I just think we need somehow to change that un that horrible behavior. 
Indeed, and isn't it interesting that being this is uh, Presbytery has designated this as Immigration Sunday that we keep in mind. There's a couple other people out there now. You too? Praise God. Um, June 28th, these boys turned 11. Two of them. Oh! June 28. Hey, all right. And, um, Happy birthday to you. I'm not done. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Chris and Emmanuel. Happy birthday to <coughs> you. Amen. Are you going to sing again? Because June 30th was my birthday. Oh. <laughs> All right, again we go. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Alrighty. We also have birthdays for Philip G, Kenny B, and Danielle P, who all are celebrating birthdays this week. Amen. Wonderful. All right. Let's just keep the immigrant, immigrants in mind and hope that there will be a policy, a federal policy, to protect immigrants coming into our country. Accept our gratefulness for your goodness and blessing towards us. Receive into your heavenly Sabbath rest for those who have died. Teach our people to rely on your strength and to accept their responsibilities to their fellow citizens, that they may elect trustworthy leaders and make wise decisions for the well-being of our society, that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. And as we make plans to celebrate American Independence Day, may we not forget to thank God for the freedom and the liberty we have been blessed with in this nation. Let no one take away the freedoms that the Lord has blessed us with. And bless, Lord, bless those who have served and continue to give their lives for our freedom, for the sacrifices others have made to build and to defend this country. So please take a few minutes to pray this 4th of July to keep America free. And loving creator, you have breathed all things into being and filled the universe with your light. Let the grace of your word and the communion of your spirit abound among us, that we may live in you and you may live in us to praise in the glory of your holy trinity, one God forever and ever. Amen. And let there be peace between the Ukrainians and the Russians, that this war will end because there's been so much loss, so much devastation. Some people have died, Lord, from this war alone, let alone all the other plagues that we have now going on where have taken lives of our loved ones. Dear Heavenly Father, let there be peace. And now let us say the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we will have the sacrament of our holy communion an invitation to the Lord's table. As we remember our unity with all Christians of every time and place, it is a most fitting occasion to observe the sacrament of communion. In preparation for the sacrament, we invite you, those at home, to look through your own kitchen to find bread and beverage. While there is rich symbolism in the elements which we traditionally use to celebrate the Lord's Supper, 
The church also has a long history of using the most fitting materials that are readily available in any given time and setting. So feel free to be creative and use what you have on hand for your bread and for your juice. Now let us celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. With the majesty of your hand, you shaped this world and you gave all that is in it. By your Holy Spirit, you breathed life into human form and set us on the earth to praise and serve you. When we wandered from your ways and were lost in sin's wilderness, you turned truth burned in the hearts of prophets who called your people to return to the path of righteousness. In the fullness of time, you sent your son to be our deliverer. In every age, your Holy Spirit has led us in your ways. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with your, you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels at the faithful time of every time and place who forever sing the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wonderful for his sin. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power he broke free from the prison of the tomb and at his command the gates of hell were opened. The one who was dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation, the lamb upon the throne. The one ascended it on high is with us always as he promised. We give you thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ. On the night before he died, he took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, all of you, and eat from it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now just come forward. drink until everyone has been served.
bread of heaven. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, the cup of salvation, poured it out with his blood for the resurrection, for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember all your mighty and merciful acts. We take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us to celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Christ, great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who baptize in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Together, let us do the prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Help us who have shared Christ's body and received his cup to be his faithful disciples so that our dealing living may be part of the life of your kingdom. And our love be your love reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray with me the prayer of dedication in the offering of our gifts as well as living in our days we may not grow weary of doing what is right but commit to speaking up for the voices healing the broken feeding the hungry and all those mercies which are such a part of your heart and hopes for all your children in Jesus name we pray amen let us now offer our gifts to God so others might know that God's steadfast love is present with them in every moment. Amen. We will now have a solo patriotic medley from Chris Rubling Jazz. <laughs> Of the I sing 
precious skies or amber waves of grain or purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shiny sea oh beautiful for pilgrim feet whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are sold. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Prayer dedication in the offering of our gifts as well as the living of our days will we not grow weary of doing what is right but commit to speaking up for the voiceless, healing the broken, feeding the hungry and all those mercies which such is a part of your heart and hopes for all your children. In Jesus name we pray, amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn number 749 Come live in the light
We had the benediction, but after worship service, I would like for people who were contacted to come forward so we can have a meeting with Mr. Glass, and we will have a meeting with the worship committee and our personnel leaders. We will have it here. And all the rest of you can go over to Fellowship Hall and enjoy UJ's family's um, refreshments. We have now had the benediction. The Lord has heard. The Lord is our helper. The Lord now sends us back into the field with the assurance that the harvest is plentiful. So go. Go out two by two. Go forth with the grace, peace, and love of God our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer now and forever. Be blessed and be a blessing to others. Amen. Postlude.